I'm excited to introduce Dr. Matthew Hall as today's lecture. Dr. Hall is a group leader in NCATS here at the NIH. He joined NCATS in 2015 as a biology group leader in the NCATS Chemical Genomic Center. Dr. Hall earned both his undergraduate degree with first class honors and his PhD from the University of Sydney. Prior to joining NCATS, Dr. Hall worked at the National Cancer Institute in the Laboratory of Cellular Biology under Dr. Michael Gottesman studying multidrug resistance. Dr. Hall is currently a leader, leads a team developing and optimizing both biochemical and cellular based assays for high throughput drug screening. I'm sure you will enjoy the presentation. Hi, my name is Matthew Hall and I'm a group leader at the NCATS Chemical Genomics Center and I'll be talking to you today about ABC transporters at the blood-brain barrier. And following from Michael Gottesman's discussion about the, the basic concepts behind ABC transporter biology and their important functional role in drug transport, really critical to drug development and our understanding of drug action as well. So as an example, we're going to talk about the brain and the, and the blood-brain barrier and delivering drugs to the brain is a massive challenge. And you can see there's a, a, a list of things here that I'm going, to, I'm going to speak about in this presentation. So we're going to talk about the fact that, that ABC transporters like PGP transport drugs out of the cells in multiple locations and for, for multiple purposes. The placenta, the brain, testis, really critical organs that the body needs to protect the integrity of. Um, we're going to talk about the blood-brain barrier, how it's, what its structure and function is composed of, uh, and the way that P-glycoprotein and other ABC transporters protect the brain at the blood-brain barrier. Um, as an example, we're going to talk about uh, imaging and directly imaging the function of ABC transporters at, at the blood-brain barrier. And that will really uh, be a, a nice tool to convey to you a sense of just how powerful and efficacious drug transporters are in protecting the brain. Um, and they really are critical. So when we think about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, there are four important parts there, adsorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion for PK. And ABC transporters play a role in all of those, as Michael, to some degree, has discussed in his earlier presentation. So absorption, it's absolutely critical. ABC transporters are expressed in the gut and mediate the bioavailability of drugs. Distribution, we'll be talking about the brain today. So distribution on an organ-by-organ -organ basis, ABC transporters can play a really critical role in regulating what drugs and other small molecules can and can't enter certain organs. Metabolism, there is a relationship between drug metabolism and transporter expression. And in fact, the expression of metabolic and drug transporter enzymes are part of the, the same um, protective operon, if you will, and, and they're co-regulated. Um, and of course, excretion. So these, as Michael mentioned, these transporters are expressed in the kidneys and in the liver, in the liver and partly through the gastrointestinal tract, they confer excretory action as well to remove drugs from the body and from blood plasma. So all ABC transporters are really critical for drug action every step of the way. So let's talk a little bit about the brain and, and drug development and delivering drugs to the brain. As I say, it's a big challenge. And, and this slide has uh, a couple of really nice figures from some, some papers by uh, Bill Partridge that you can see the references to on the bottom right there. Um, and really, the, the takeaway from this, if, if nothing else comes from this slide, is that 98% of small molecule drugs do not cross the blood-brain barrier. And you can imagine, therefore, that the failure rate is really profound. So if you're involved in a drug development program, you have a CNS disorder you'd like to develop a small molecule towards, you might understand the target, you might not. You, that part of that MedChem program is understanding whether or not a small molecule is susceptible to transport by the ABC transporters can be transported across the blood-brain barrier. And I'm not going to talk you through any examples of it, but I can refer you to the literature and you'll see again and again stories of failure of experimental therapeutics that either can't get into the brain of the animal models that are being utilized, or when they get into humans, the brain penetrance is not adequate and the program is abandoned. And if you look at large pharma companies, most of them do not have strong programs in developing drugs against CNS targets or CNS disorders anymore because the, the valley of death that exists there in drug development is so profound. And you can blame the blood-brain barrier for that. So for the, the range of CNS disorders that people try to treat, uh, many of them are refractory to small molecule drug therapy, uh, not currently drugged or treated. And, and, and as I say, it may be because of an understanding of the target. It may be because of a lack of understanding of how to deliver a small molecule therapeutic across the blood-brain barrier. And this figure on the right here is, is, is quite a, a remarkable example of just how powerful 
the blood-brain barrier can be. And, it, and it, it's a modern, relatively modern autoradiogram of radiolabel histamine that's been injected into this rodent. And you can see that it's distributed throughout the entire body. And the way this is achieved is that after the radiolabeled molecule is injected into the animal, it's sacrificed, fixed, sliced, and put down on film. And so where you see dark signal, that's actually radiation exposing the film, just like the original Ronchin experiments over 100 years ago. This experiment um, demonstrates that this radiolabeled histamine is distributed everywhere through the body of this animal except for the, the brain, brain stem, and, and spinal cord. And the reason for that is that the blood-brain barrier prevents it from distributing to that part of the body. So this is a modern example with a radiolabeled small molecule, but in fact it, it perfectly mirrors the original experiments uh, that were performed by Paul Ehrlich, who discovered the blood-brain barrier and was awarded the Nobel Prize in part for that work. He injected rabbits with dyes such as tripan blue, and notice the dye distributed everywhere in the body on, when he examined them on necropsy. Didn't get into the brain. And so he did the reverse experiment. He injected the dye straight into the brain, and he saw that the dye was distributed in the brain and spinal column of the animals, but it had an egress back out into the parenchyma of the body. And so he recognized that there was a barrier between the brain and the rest of the body that must be playing a protective role for the brain. So 98% of small molecules don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and biotherapeutics, uh, experimental therapeutics, such as uh, antibody-directed therapeutics, enzyme therapies, there are very limited strategies for delivering those to the brain as well, and they're usually quite invasive. Um, there are emerging technologies addressing that at the moment. Um, and so as a result, very few companies have blood-brain barrier targeting programs. Um, and academic neuroscience programs um, also have difficulties in, in addressing this area. So it's very underserved. This is an example of, of, of just how difficult it can be to deliver a drug to the brain. So let's take a look here. We've got heroin, and as we know, heroin is a drug of abuse. Um, it's an opioid receptor agonist and highly addictive. And it's got these two acetyl groups. It's actually also known as diacetylmorphine. And the reason is that this very lipo relatively lipophilic molecule has reasonable brain uptake, quite, um, certainly high uptake relative to the other molecules that we're showing here. Once heroin crosses the blood-brain barrier and enters the brain, being relatively lipophilic, it's actually metabolized by, through deacetylation into morphine. And morphine is actually the active drug that binds the mu opioid receptor. Heroin is a prodrug, and I know in earlier parts of this course, we've, you've talked a little bit about prodrugs. So heroin is a prodrug that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Once it's crossed the blood-brain barrier, it's metabolized into the active morphine. Morphine itself, if it's directly injected, has relatively low brain uptake. And, and so has a, a, a very modulated um, neuroactive effect as a result. And so this is an example of how you can imagine from a, a medicinal chemistry or a drug development point of view, having some insight into the, into the fact that modification to a small molecule can change brain penetrance is a really powerful observation. Codeine is here in the middle as an example of an over-the-counter opioid receptor agonist. It's slightly modified. It's not as powerful an agonist, and it also has intermediate brain uptake. So it, it works. So these are just some examples here, but, but there, are, there are a number, and, and people have understood for a significant period of time that basic physicochemical properties can regulate brain penetrance. Um, on the previous slide with heroin, it, we, said, we said it was more lipophilic. So it had a higher log P, a log of the partition coefficient. This is a small sample of molecules, again, measuring brain uptake from a really classic paper from the early 90s, looking at, at, at dopamine receptor agonists and measuring brain uptake. And you can see there's a, almost an inverse parabolic relationship here where we have log P across the x-axis looking at brain uptake. And you can see as log P increases, brain penetrance um, increases as well. And that, this is really at around 2.5 considered to be, as a rule of thumb, the optimal log P for a small molecule that you want to enter the brain. Unfortunately, the formula is not that simple and straightforward, but, but it's a good rule of thumb and medicinal chemists tend to use it. Um, increase log P even higher and, and, and brain uptake is reduced again. So why is this occurring? So if you have a lower log P, you have poor uh, lipid bilayer permeability and so you don't have poor penetrance or permeability. Um, look at the optimal log P, it's just right, it's almost like a Goldilocks scenario. Increase the log P too high, you tend to have very high protein binding. The higher the log P of a molecule, the higher the protein binding in blood plasma and there's very little available to enter the brain. And there's also a theory that that you may end up having a, a very high residence time in lipid bilayers, and so the, the molecules don't move across into the, into the brain. So again, log P can really have an important impact 
on penetrance into the brain. And I, and I put this slide in here because it's not directly related to ABC transporters, but I, I, I've mentioned passive diffusion and permeability a couple of times now. And there's actually a, a been a reboot of a very uh, active debate about whether passive diffusion really exists a, as a mechanism for drugs to enter into cells. Um, it's, a, it's a very um, well-mannered debate that's occurring back and forth in reviews. And there are really two groups. And it initially started with this classic uh, review that was published a number of years ago now um, that described the hypothesis that, in fact, no drug diffuses across lipid bilayers to enter the cell. And all cell penetrance is the result of promiscuous uptake through multiple drug uptake transporters. And I know Kathy Giacomini has a whole class dedicated to the importance of, of permeability transporters in drug action. But a counter argument came out. And if you follow these papers, you'll see there's multiple subsequent back and forth papers about this, arguing that indeed there is passive diffusion and carrier mediated drug transport does occur in some situations, but not all. Um, and they're really, they're really worth reading and, and investigating to understand, realize and recognize that, that even, even today, there's a large amount of debate about even simple aspects of drug action, like how do drugs enter the cell generally? Is passive diffusion real? I think passive diffusion is real. I think the blood-brain barrier helps support that argument as well. This is another classic piece of data. This one is generated in the early 80s, and in fact, it was generated before p glycoprotein was understood as a protein and as a drug transporter. And so some of the outlying data points that I've circled here were actually mysterious at the time the data was generated. The understanding wasn't really well recognized, but I'll explain to you exactly why these outliers occur. So these investigators had taken a fairly large group of small molecules. They'd measured permeability and uptake into the brain, CNS permeability. And you can see for most of these molecules that are these white dots here, there's a good correlation in this window between increasing log P and increasing permeability into the brain. So increased log P, higher brain penetrance. So I think we've established fairly well that that relationship exists over the last few slides, but we see something else occurring here as well. Let's take a look up the top here and you can see D-glucose, very hydrophilic molecule, does not diffuse across lipid bilayers. In fact, some people use it as a negative control for diffusion experiments. And it's got higher uptake into the brain than you would expect based on its log P. How is that occurring? Well, we all know now in 2017 that of course, glucose uptake transporters are very highly expressed at the blood-brain barrier and they, and they are highly expressed to facilitate maximal absorption of glucose into the brain because it's critical for, for energy generation. And so as a result, we have a transporter mediated uptake that, that brings the uptake of this molecule away from, away from what you would expect to see based on the, the, the relationship that we're looking at here. Conversely, there are a number of molecules in this early paper, bleomycin, adriamycin, epirubicin, cyclosporin, vincristin, that had much lower uptake into the brain than one would anticipate based on their log P alone. Again, as I say, at the time this paper was published, 1980, it wasn't understood exactly why this was, but we now know that P-glycoprotein is expressed at the blood-brain barrier and it can prevent the uptake of these molecules into the brain. One thing I'd comment on here, and, and Michael would have referred to the fact that, that most of uh, a lot of small molecules that are recognized by drug transporters are natural products. And in fact, the drug transporters evolved as we did as organisms to recognize toxic natural products and prevent them from entering the body. That's exactly what's happening with these drug transporters here. All of these drug examples are derived from natural products. They were discovered from natural product screening. And P-glycoprotein evolved to recognize these small molecules and preclude them from entering the brain and other sites that might be expressing a lot of drug transporter. And Michael talked about the fact that he was critical in discovering P-glycoprotein by studying multidrug resistance. And that was where P-glycoprotein was first discovered and understood. It was only later, once the role of ABC transporters like PGP were identified in drug resistant cancers, that the physiologic role of ABC transporters was recognized. And that's what we're looking at here. This is a, a, a set of diagrams that explain the role of these drug transporters and how they work at the blood-brain barrier. So let's take a look down here, and this is a schematic from a, a, a review we wrote a few years ago that shows a cross-section of a capillary in the brain, and we can see there's the luminal space where the blood flow is occurring, and, and the, the capillaries are lined, as one would expect, with endothelial cells. These endothelial cells make up the, make up the capillary. Um, they're flanked on the basolateral side by a basolateral membrane, and, and, and touching that basolateral membrane are astrocytes and pericytes that are now very well understood to, to very tightly regulate and control uh, 
the function of the blood-brain barrier through cell signaling. Let's zoom in and take a look at one of these endothelial cells and what's happening here. Right on the surface, the interface of the, the, the luminal blood interacting with the endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier. And there's two things that are taking place here that really constitute the blood-brain barrier. The first are tight junctions. There are a series of protein-protein contacts that occur between these endothelial cells that really create a zipper-like structure and prevent anything from diffusing through paracellular transport between cells and into the brain. That's the way a lot of small molecules and proteins can um, enter into organ space through the vasculature in the periphery of the body, but that's not the case at the blood-brain barrier because of these tight junctions. And the other active defense mechanism that's, that's occurring here are a number of ABC transporters, including p glycoprotein, and two others we'll talk about, ABCG2 and the MRP family of transporters, that are oriented towards the lumen, their blood facing, to intercept any small molecule that tries to diffuse into endothelial cells. They're really intercepted and effluxed at the luminal surface of the blood-brain barrier. They never even get to cross the vasculature, let alone enter the brain. On the right-hand side here, I'm showing a, a, a separate area of the brain, the choroid plexus, which is really critical for generating cerebrospinal fluid. And those drug transporters also play an important protective role at the choroid plexus to make sure drugs can't enter the cerebrospinal fluid and have a, sort of a back door into the brain through CSF penetrance. So ABC transporters are playing a protective role everywhere. We can zoom in here, and this is actually a model derived from a crystal structure, and it's to scale, and you can see p glycoprotein embedded in the lipid bilayer. And this small molecule, this is doxorubicin, a common anti-cancer drug, it's drawn to scale as well. And so you can see on the extracellular space, the apical or luminal side, the small molecule is at a high concentration, can diffuse across a lipid bilayer under normal circumstances, but ABC transporters intercept it, bind it, and use ATP to pump that small molecule back out to the extracellular space against the concentration gradient. And because it's ATP dependent, it's an energy dependent process, it can work against the concentration gradient and result in very little, if any, drug entering the brain. We'll be showing with our imaging examples some, some really nice um, case studies. So there are three ABC transporter classes that we saw in the scheme on the last slide, p glycoprotein, the MRP family, and ABCG2. They're all exp expressed in endothelial cell, and together they limit drug delivery to the brain. They also limit uh, xenobiotic penetrance to the brain, small molecule toxins that might be ingested in diet. They play a general protective role. That means that when the pharmaceutical, the modern pharmaceutical industry came along, we were basically primed to make life as difficult as possible for people trying to develop drugs to tackle um, neurologic disorders. Um, there's also an association between the overexpression of these ABC transporters and a number of, of disorders in the brain. And so, for example, there's a suggestion that in drug-resistant epilepsy, an overexpression of these ABC transporters works to further decrease the amount of anti-epileptic drug getting to the epileptogenic focus, and therefore the patient stops responding to their, the anti-epileptic medication that they're on. Um, HIV infection of the brain is one way that, that HIV can evade um, antiviral drug therapy and total cures. And of course, I've mentioned multidrug resistance in cancer, and, and that can also play out in brain cancers. And I'll, and I'll show you an example of that. So there are, this Venn diagram on the right shows three ABC transporters and a number of substrates that have been tested against all three transporters. And what you can see here is that most of the drug substrates that have been studied here are transported by more than one ABC transporter. So there's actually a, a redundancy in substrate specificity or selectivity of these ABC transporters. So there's amazing chemical coverage and multiple drugs are transported by multiple ABC transporters. So it's an extremely efficient system that's set up to prevent molecules from entering the brain. Of course, there are lots of examples of drugs that do enter the brain and drugs of abuse that enter the brain as well. Um, we talked about heroin a little earlier, and that's a really obvious drug of abuse example. But there are whole classes of drugs, such as anti-epileptic drugs or antidepressants, that have been developed and optimized based on brain penetrance. So, as I mentioned, there are a, a remarkable number of drug transporters that are expressed at the blood-brain barrier. Um, and a few years ago, we, we analyzed some data that had been published in quantitative proteomic studies to compare the expression of these transporters side by side. You can see the, the three main drug transporter families um, that I mentioned, P-glycoprotein, the MRPs, MRP4, and, and ABCG2, which is also called BCRP, as Michael mentioned, that are expressed at the blood-brain barrier to protect and prevent drug ingress into the brain. 
and they're expressed at, at reasonable concentrations um, um, in femtomoles per microgram of protein. Uh, ABCG2 and ABCB1 peak glycoprotein are, are relatively equally expressed and play uh, a, a strong role in protection at the brain. And, and Kathy Giacomini will address, uh, probably not discussing the blood-brain barrier, but discuss the role of solute carrier transporters, and many of those are expressed at the blood-brain barrier to selectively facilitate the uptake of important um, metabolites and nutrients that are needed in the brain. So there are two glucose uptake transporters, um, and, and there's also a, a, an amino acid um, coordinated transporter as well that's expressed at very high levels at the blood-brain barrier um, that can also facilitate the uptake of glutamine. Down on the bottom left here, let's talk about the volume of blood flow that's in the brain and how is it regulated by the blood-brain barrier. So 5% of the brain is vascular volume at any point in time. So that 5% of the brain volume is blood volume. But when you narrow that down to the volume that's actually the capillary bed in the brain, 2% of the total brain volume is protected by capillaries. And this is an electron micrograph of, of cat, blood, uh, cat blood vasculature of all things. Um, and, and images like this we use to, to quantify. So this is a plastic cast of a human brain showing the vasculature. This is an electron micrograph zooming in. And it's said that, that no cell is more than 100 microns from the nearest capillary. And so really critical for oxygen and glucose supply to the brain that they're very proximal to capillaries. Highly dense network. If we take a look at a cross-section of electron micrograph of, of the blood-brain barrier, you can see that the majority of a capillary is, of course, blood. But, but it's surrounded by these um, volume, the cell endothelial uh, layer here. And in fact, there was a really neat study done in the, in the 1970s where they took a projection of these uh, cross-sections, literally cut them out with scissors and paper, weighed the piece of paper, and determined that the capillary makes up about, by weight, about 10% of the volume of the blood-brain barrier. And if you do the math on all the numbers that I've thrown at you, you learn that the brain is composed, only 0.2% of the total brain volume are endothelial cells. And so 0.2% of all the, brain, the cells in the brain are tasked with the job of protecting the brain by forming that functional blood blood-brain barrier. So it's a remarkably efficient system that's not overtaxing for the brain. Now, there are, I mentioned a number of pathologies that are associated with blood-brain barrier dysregulation, and, and brain tumors are probably one of the better known. And in fact, when a brain tumor is forming in the brain, the vasculature is disrupted. And, and we, can, we can see that here on, on the left through a, through a classic MRI, the patient has received a gadolinium contrast agent. Now, gadolinium contrast agents are negatively charged. Uh, they don't easily diffuse and they can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you look at the normal regions of the brain in this patient, you can see very low contrast levels. But if you look over here to the left, this patient has a, a glioblastoma and you can see very high contrast because the blood-brain barrier is broken down and the contrast agent can enter in, into that GBM. And so it, the, that's one way that a, that a, a surgical neurologist in, in, in collaboration um, with radiology colleagues can diagnose a, a, a brain tumor and decide on surgical intervention. You can also see here there's a low-grade glioma where the blood-brain barrier really hasn't been compromised and there's not strong contrast there and that would require further follow-up. And so the blood-brain barrier um, and its breakdown is actually used as part of diagnosis of, of brain tumors using contrast agents. And this of course is translated into lots of animal models that are used using contrast agents to monitor things like the size of brain tumors and, how, and the, the amount of penetrance um, that takes place there and for um, sophisticated follow-up studies. So, we had decided to, to, to try and image the drug transport of function at the blood-brain barrier, and we had some really fantastic uh, collaborative investigators at the National Institutes of Mental Health, Bob Innes and Victor Pike, who were part of a positron emission tomography imaging team, PET imaging. And together we were thinking about how can we study PGP function at the blood-brain barrier. So the, the conceptual idea was very simple. A, a radio-labeled substrate that was injected into an animal would be intercepted by transporters and it wouldn't be able to enter the brain. And so in fact, if you entered a radio tracer, much like the gadolinium contrast agent on the previous slide, you wouldn't really see a lot of brain intensity. However, if you co-inject an inhibitor, a pharmacologic blocker of ABC transporters like PGP, and several of those do exist, you would stop the drug transporter from working. And when you inject that radio tracer, it'll be able to diffuse into the brain and you should see nice brain signal. And, and I'm sort of giving away the story here because this is experimental data down the bottom that, that, that proves the hypothesis that I'm putting to you. So there, there, are, there was a precedent for this but not studying the brain and that's that for a long time given that transporters were known to play a role in drug resistant cancer, studies had been done here at the NIH Clinical Center 
particularly by Susan Bates and Tito Foho, who'd been working with a technetian radio labeled drug transporter substrate that they would inject into patients. This patient has a metastasis to the thigh, and you can see that after this uh, radio labeled compound called Sestamibi is injected, you can see a faint trace of uptake into the tumor. It stands out against the muscle here in the thigh. Um, you can also see, by the way, the uh, excretory pathway for this radio tracer because these drug transporters do play a role and build up in the bladder. Um, and when the same patient was co-injected with Turiquidar, which pharmacologically blocks the drug transporters, you can see that this drug-resistant tumor could no longer pump out the radio tracer. And so it builds up an initial injection time to pretty high levels, and then over time it dis diffuses out again. But, but you can see the difference between a, this drug-resistant patient without and with a blocker of the drug transporter, and there's an increase in signal here. And so this patient can, was known to have cancer and could be diagnosed with a drug-resistant form. You can also see, because of the blocker, a really reduced amount of bladder uh, tracer as a result of inhibited excretion of this radio tracer. And so you can actually watch the excretion of these radio tracers conveniently at the same time because that was sort of a below the waist image that was being collected there. And so given that there was some precedent for imaging generally and we wanted to develop a radio tracer, there were some criteria that were set as part of the study. The first is a, a rule of thumb for PET, radiochemical purity would be needed in the brain. And so you need to be studying and imaging a molecule that, that isn't broken down and metabolized very quickly because otherwise you'll be imaging as many metabolites as the parent tracer. The second, from our point of view, imaging transporters is we needed something that was highly selective for peak lycoprotein. We didn't want to study all the transporters at once. That would be a difficult study to interpret. So we needed to identify a molecule only transported by PGP. And if you think back to the Venn diagram that I showed a few slides ago, there were a few molecules there. So there were some clues about how we could pursue that. And the third rule for PET generally is you need a high magnitude of signal. What you want to measure needs to stand out from the background. And in fact, for us, that was pretty straightforward because I already showed you that we should expect no brain signal under normal conditions. And if we block the transporter, we should get high signal. So we had an advantage there over uh, normal PET imaging people. And so the, the lead traces that were selected for this study were uh, loperamide and, and a, a demethylated form of loperamide called desmethyl loperamide. So why, why was this picked? It was picked because it's been an over-the-counter drug for many, many years now. And, and some of you watching this video may fortunately or unfortunately know of it. It's sold under the name Imodium. It's an opioid receptor agonist, in fact, and it's used to, to prevent diarrhea in patients suffering from acute diarrhea. Um, I mentioned it's an opioid receptor agonist. That pharmacologic mechanism of action is exerted at the gut to prevent diarrhea. So it's an opioid, but it's sold over the counter. Why can it be sold over the counter? It's sold over the counter because it's known to be um, a very strong pea glycoprotein substrate that cannot cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. If it could, and if it did have central opioid agonist effects, it wouldn't be an over-the-counter compound at all. And so we took a look at this small molecule. Um, uh, doctors Pike uh, and Innes had, had recognized that there was a way to radio label this small molecule so that it could be used for in vivo study. Doc, uh, Dr. Innes had, had done some preliminary studies and recognized that, that it did, indeed didn't enter the brain. And so in collaboration um, with, with Drs. Pike and Innes, we set about trying to understand its metabolic stability, its specificity at drug transporters, and whether it would be a useful radio transporter. And really, the two key studies were an in vitro and in vivo uh, set of transporter studies. Here's the cell work. We radio labeled desmethyl loperamide. Uh, we would expose it to cells that do not and do express peak like a protein. And you can see these cells that express PGP, very little drug, very little radio labeled loperamide gets into these cells because of the drug, the action of peak like a protein on loperamide. So that is what we expected. The really nice thing that we saw with this particular radio tracer when we examined it is that if we took cells expressing ABCG2 and one of the MRP transporters, they didn't have any effect on the entry of loperamide into those cells. And so overexpression systems showed that they, G2 and the MRPs had no effect on the paramide. So that looks like we've got a pretty specific radio tracer. We could also do in vivo PET studies looking at brain signal. And in fact, when radio labeled the paramide was injected to wild type mice or mice with, that had ABCC1, the MRP transporter, or ABCG2 knocked out, there was still very little uptake into the brain. And, and, the, and the signal is measured over time, and this is called a time activity curve. However, when we took um, my, a mouse model that, where the ABC B1 transporter peaked like a protein, and in fact mice through the vagaries of nature have two peaked like a proteins, but when they were both genetically deleted, 
you can see very high brain penetrance and very prolonged stable brain penetrance as well. And so these genetic studies reinforce what we've seen in our cell-based studies. The pyramide is a specific substrate of human and mouse peak like a protein and we could go about doing cell studies. And so here's some nice sample data here. In the mouse, very little brain uptake. If you co-inject these animals with a blocker of peak like a protein or if you use the genetic knockout, you see quite high brain penetrance. And this is an MRI side by side to, so you can see that this signal corresponds to the, to the brain region. We could do the same thing in, in monkeys, in the rhesus in this case, and you can see very low signal in the monkey. When the monkey, there are no genetic knockout studies, of course, but when you co-inject with the pharmacologic blocker of the transporter, very high uptake into the brain corresponding to the, um, the MRI image here. Now, there is a big hotspot of signal that you see under here arrowed in these studies. That's signal from the pituitary. The pituitary is outside the blood-brain barrier, and so you can see the pituitary gives very high signal um, along with MRI signals, this is a, a really nice way to help the radiologist interpreting these images from orienting the images and, and orienting themselves when they're looking at these signals. So there's a nice, we actually have an outside the blood-brain barrier control built into the images through the pituitary. Here's the, um, some further studies um, trying to understand what was happening in the monkey brain. Again, high pituitary lone brain signal until PGP blockade takes place with pharmacologic inhibition. For the monkey studies, we were using another pharmacologic blocker called DCPQ. And the nice thing is that at a pharmacologic achieve, pharmacologically achievable dose of inhibitor, we get very high uptake of loperamide, and it's very stable in the brain. And very low baseline signal when there isn't a pharmacologic blocker. p glycoprotein can really keep this transporter out of the brain. So these studies are important as well because one of the things I've talked about is how hard it is to get drug trans drugs transport substrates into the brain. And so there's a very active field of study trying to understand whether co-injecting or co-administering an adjuvant blocker of p-glycoprotein might be a way to facilitate increased drug uptake of a small molecule drug candidate. And this is proof, perhaps, that that's achievable. And there's multiple groups that are studying that at the moment. So going from the animal models, we went into the human. And these are just some side-by-side -side studies at 3 minutes, 20 minutes, and 100 minutes of a patient that's been injected with DLOP. The first thing you can see, I know you wanted to look there, is the brain. That's what we're talking about, very low uptake into the brain. However, if we take a look below the neck at this patient, you can see quite high signal in other organ sites. Of course, there aren't protective mechanisms in the lung, and you can see pretty reasonable uptake here. Um, the kidneys are the excretory pathway, and you can see very strong kidney signal as a result. And in fact, as the kidney single signal goes down in the kidneys, you see a little bit of buildup in the liver, probably because of metabolic action. But also you see increased bladder signal because of the urinary and bladder excretion through the kidneys of this radio tracer. So really nice images there of what's happening. But let's take a little closer look at the brain here. So this is a, a three minute or zero to 10 minute summed image of brain signal. And what you're looking at is initially nothing. If you look at where the brain is, the brain is evidenced by the absence of any signal at all. And we can rotate this a few times here to take a look at this, this video. Um, I mentioned the choroid plexus earlier, and in fact, you can see signal from the blood pool in the choroid plexus, and you can see the venous sinus, the strong venous sinus drainage that's occurring here. And if you look really closely, my favorite is that behind the eye, there seems to be some blood, blood pooling that's taking place, and you can see the back of the eyes. In fact, the, the, the eye has its own barrier called the blood retinal barrier that also protects the eye from, from entry. And it's very similarly constructed to the blood-brain barrier. And it also presents a particular pharmacologic challenge for treating some drugs, such as dry eye disease, that require drug penetrance to the eye. Where the eye has an advantage is eye drops. So we can do direct topical application to the eye of a drug um, to, for experimental, experimental or pharma, for pharmacologic administration um, in an FDA-approved setting as well. We don't quite have that advantage in the brain, although as I mentioned earlier, there are some very invasive methodologies that are used for direct drug delivery to the brain under certain circumstances. So I mentioned we did human studies. Let's take a look now at a, um, a cross section of a PET study. Yet again, very low uptake. And what we're looking at here, these hotspots at this level within the brain, and you can see it in the MRI as the choroid plexus um, in the ventricles. And so very high signal. Again, choroid plexus is outside the blood-brain barrier. Um, this is a lower dose of a pharmacologic blocker of, to, called Turiquidar, and you can see um, that some blockade of p glycoprotein has occurred and there's some increased signal into the brain. Again, validation 
First of all, imaging of the profound efficiency of pea glycoprotein at preventing drug ingress into the brain and validation of pharmacologic blockade to try and improve drug penetrance into the brain. And, and it's an area of study. So pea glycoprotein, that was fun. Um, there's another important drug transporter at the blood-brain barrier, ABCG2. And we'd begun to study ABCG2 and its role at the blood-brain barrier. And there's quite a lot of literature arguing that it played a, a minor role in, in protection. And so we wanted to see if we could directly study drug transport at the blood-brain barrier. It had never been achieved before, but I mentioned that one of the three criteria for imaging that we set down, and maybe the most important one from a drug transport point of view, is specificity. We needed a specific drug transport substrate of ABCG2, and we couldn't find one. We did quite a lot of work on it, um, and in our reading, we accidentally read and noted that luciferin here is a sp was an ABCG2 transport substrate, and it was one of many that we decided to follow up on and examine. Some of you watching this may not know much about luciferin, but luciferin is well known in the, in, in the um, assay development and experimental biology fields because it's the substrate from the firefly, the, fi the enzyme firefly luciferase that uses dioxygen and ATP, acts on luciferin, produces oxyluciferin, and it also produces light. And so this enzyme substrate system is responsible for the fact that a firefly's uh, rear end glows in the nighttime. And that's, that enzymatic system has been used in experimental biology for a range of different studies. And as I say, we'd, we'd, we'd read that, that luciferin was a specific ABC, uh, was a ABCG2 substrate. We didn't know whether or not it was specific. And unfortunately, our, our colleagues in PET radiochemistry informed us that it was unable to be radio labeled in this form. And so we couldn't do a PET study with this, but in reading some old literature, and you can see a 1958 paper here and some data on the left-hand side there. So it's okay to read papers from before you were born. Sometimes you can re re learn really important things from old papers. And, and here's a really great example. What we found when we were reading is that yes, we all know now that, that, that luciferin is a reporter that can produce bioluminescence with luciferase. So that's a readout we have right there. We could possibly take advantage of bioluminescence, but it's also fluorescent. And that's a really useful lab-based uh, tool for studying a molecule. Um, it could be excited or in the UV range, 350 nanometers, and it will emit at 530. So it's fluorescent in its own right without needing an enzyme system to create bioluminescence. The other thing when we looked at the literature we saw, and you always see, should look for this paper in um, experimental therapeutic studies, somewhere somebody did a biodistribution study where they'll literally administer a radio labeled form of a drug to an animal, perform an acropsy, and they'll measure the, radio, the radioactivity levels in each of the organs to see where this drug goes. And you can see very low brain levels. So we have an ABCG2 substrate, very low brain levels. Maybe we've got something we can study the blood brain barrier with. So let's take advantage of that fluorescence. You can see here some straightforward pictures. Here's a cell overexpressing ABCG2, and D-luciferin is not getting in. However, if we look again using our fluorescence microscopy with a pharmacologic blocker of D-luciferin, which is called KO143, high fluorescence. Block the transporter, luciferin gets into these cells. So it looks like we're on the right track. So we set up a quantitative assay using flow cytometry. Cells that don't express G2 accumulated very high levels of luciferin, measuring its fluorescence. However, when you express ABCG2, very low fluorescence, very low accumulation into these cells. Block the transporter and we get high expression. Okay, so let's do those studies in triplicate and let's study cells expressing different transporters. And you can see just like the pyramide with PGP, when we do quantitative accumulation, a cell line that's expressing ABCG2 had very low levels of accumulation. If we blocked G2, they became very high. This is the data we're looking at qualitatively here. Now it's in a quantitative fashion. But when we look at PGP, there's very high accumulation in PGP expressing cells very high accumulation in MRP1 expressing cells. So we have a specific ABCG2 transport substrate here. Only ABCG2 stops it from entering the cells. But how are we going to image it and how are we going to study it? And so we set upon a hypothesis that could, we could use in a mouse imaging context to study the blood-brain barrier. We could inject an animal that, that with luciferin and if we could find a transgenic model that only expressed luciferase, the enzyme that luciferin needs, in astrocytes in the brain, then under normal conditions, ABCG2 would not let this luciferin get into the blood-brain barrier, it would keep it out. But if we co-injected with a blocker of ABCG2, and I'll show you that again, if we co-inject with a blocker of ABCG2, now luciferin can get into the brain, find that luciferase in the brain, and we should get light bioluminescence produced in the brain, and we can image that and we can quantify it. So how are we going to achieve that? 
Well, luckily for us, there were a number of models that people had reported where they did express um, luciferase specifically in the brain using the promoter for GFAP, which is a marker for astrocytes. And when we expressed, injected luciferin into the brain under baseline levels, we saw very low levels. And so what we're looking at here is the underside of the mouse head. If we turn the mouse over, the signal's lower because of the skull. So we put it on its back in a supine position, very low signal. And then if we inject with blockers of ABCG2, you can see the more, the higher the dose, the higher the signal. A dose effect response, it's exactly what you'd expect based on everything you've done in this class so far. We can generate time activity curves here to follow this. Very low levels of bioluminescence with luciferin. We can inject KO143, our blocker. We get increasing brain signal. We take the area under the curve, something else you've already done in this class, to integrate that signal. And you can see by a 16 milligram per kilogram dose, we've basically saturated and fully inhibited ABCG2, and we have maximal signal. We can derive the ED50, the erect effective dose for 50% of the maximal response. Again, part of your clinical pharmacology class and, and get an ED50 value of about 6.5 milligrams per kilogram. And one of the important experiments we had to do here was make sure we're really imaging brain signal and not mouse signal. And so here we've taken the brain out. We have a brainless mouse and you can see there's no more signal. The brain is still producing bioluminescence. And so all that signal that you're looking at up the top here is coming from the brain. It's not coming from the tongue or the nose or the ear or somewhere else. So we developed there in those two stories ways to study p glycoprotein and ABCG2 at the blood-brain barrier. And I told you I wasn't going to parade a, a litany of drug development failures in front of you to emphasize how important these drug transporters are for um, the development of drugs that need to get into the brain. But let's flip it and I'll just give you an interesting example of how pharma has to tackle the blood-brain barrier and, some, and p glycoprotein. And this is the opposite of the normal example. So the next couple of slides I'm just going to very briefly walk you through a nice set of studies from Merck where some um, um, assay biologists and medicinal chemists are working side by side as part of a team science project to develop blockers of a potassium ion channel. And they, the goal of doing that in the heart was to regulate cardiac arrhythmia. So they had a target, the KV 1.5 potassium channel, and along with that target, um, they had an expected pharmacologic response, the regulation of a cardiac arrhythmia. So they had a target, they conducted a high throughput screen against the potassium channel, of interest. And um, they had a hit from that high throughput screen, this small molecule here that's labeled number one. So you have a hit from a screen and now you need to do medicinal chemistry, as you'll hear about in later classes, to improve the activity of this molecule and optimize its property for in vivo use in animal models and in humans. You can see the, the authors of this paper acknowledge that there was prior art, something else you'll talk about in drug discovery, prior art that already existed in the literature that can be used to validate a hypothesis around a target. But they had their hit. They wanted to make a new chemical entity, something they could patent, get pr protection or intellectual coverage for as part of a drug development program. And they wanted to march this forward. But they had a specific criteria as part of their hits. They really liked the activity of this molecule, but they wanted to have a molecule that could interact with potassium channel in the heart, but not get into the brain, where it would interact with potassium channels in the brain and cause toxicity. So they actually wanted a PGP substrate that couldn't get into the brain. What other drug development programs suffer from is something that they really wanted. And so when they started studying their hit from the screen, they found that, wouldn't you know it, they had a drug that did get into the brain. The thing that everybody else is desiring was actually their curse. And so they actually went through a MedChem campaign and um, doing variations on their molecule to retain their activity against the potassium channel target, but to install substrate susceptibility to peak like a protein so it could be kept out of the brain. And so as they went from this analog that had a carboxylic acid, they installed a number of substituted amines here. These amines, unfortunately, um, were expected to make the molecule a PGP substrate. It didn't happen. It could still get into the brain. It was still active against the target, so they weren't destroying their on target activity, but they needed to make sure they had a substrate. Finally, through some subtle variations with MedChem, you can see um, they had a primary amine here. They now had a PGP substrate. It didn't get into the brain, but they destroyed their potassium channel antagonism. And so needed to do some further SAR modifications to get what they finally needed. A substrate of PGP that couldn't get into the brain, but that was active against the target in the periphery in the heart. So they had their, their combination of desirable activities here. Uh, it's a really nice paper. I encourage you to look to it. The reference was on the previous slide. The title's at the top here. 
um, I've checked as part of putting together this presentation about what Merck has done with that lead. And in fact, they're still advancing this series several years later through medicinal chemistry programs to optimize the drug development programs. And in the papers that I've, I've listed the titles for up here and the references are down the bottom, you can see they're going through se further second and third generation iterations. They've improved activity further. They still emphasize that they need molecules that are PGP substrates that can't get into the brain. And they're now in clinical trials with these molecules and they're in humans. And so this is an example how understanding biodistribution and PGP transport susceptibility was a really important part of, of a, 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 a cardiac target, not a, not a brain target. Um, so there's really universal uh, importance here for understanding the importance of drug transporters in the brain. There's another important site here I wanted to mention. We did some imaging work on. We've really focused on the blood-brain barrier, but there are other sites like the blood-retinal barrier that I mentioned, the blood-testes barrier that's very important, and the blood-placental barrier that also forms um, in pregnant women. Um, it forms as part of the placenta that provides to a number of roles including supplying nutrients uh, to the forming fetus and embryo, as well as a protective role, just like at the blood-brain barrier, to make sure no toxins can cross the placenta and enter the, the, the circulatory system of, of the embryo or fetus. And we generated a, a very analogous system here where we, in fact, took a male mouse that, just ex that was just a transgenically um, expressing a lot of luciferase, crossed it with a wild-type female mouse so she wouldn't express any luciferase at all, but the pups in the in the in behind the blood placental barrier would be expressing luciferase, and so under this model, you could inject the ho the mother with luciferin. It wouldn't cross the blood placental barrier under normal si situations. However, if we pharmacologically blocked ABCG2, luciferin would be able to cross the blood placental barrier. Um, and by the way, if you really like these pictures, I'm recording this talk at the the part of the medical arts facility at the NH. It's exactly the same place that generates these kind of beautiful figures. So I'd really encourage anyone out there in the intramural program that's, that's trying to create really nice artwork to convey the research that they're doing to talk to medical arts. They do a really beautiful job. This is one of my favorite figures I've ever been involved in. Um, you can see down the bottom here that this played out in the animal studies. Here's, here is a male mouse, lots of luciferase. Here is a female mouse. Here is a female mouse that's impregnated. And you can see the signal that's occurring here and that's specific to the pups behind the placenta. And in fact, similar to the time activity curves that I showed you on the previous slides, you can see low bioluminescence in, in the pregnant female. However, once we co-inject an ABCG2 blocker, we get very high signal. And in fact, this was the first demonstration of drug transport activity through imaging studies at the blood placental barrier. So I've told you that these ABC transporters have play a really important role in understanding drug action and in the early stages of the drug discovery and development process. Um, of course, when you're doing high throughput screening and, and, and uh, as we do at NCATS and identifying small molecules, from program to program, we need to understand whether our molecules are drug, drug transport substrates. How do we do this in the lab? So I've showed you a lot of animal studies. I've showed you a lot of sophisticated imaging studies. These are obviously oriented towards understanding basic physiology of, or pathology of drug transport action. But if you've got small molecules and you need to study this, the normal system people will use is a transwell system. So you actually place your cells in a transwell insert. They actually form a nice cell layer and they form those tight junctions, just like at the blood-brain barrier. If you put a non-permeable molecule here, like a protein, a small molecule dye like Lucifer yellow, it actually can't cross and diffuse th across these cells. And so it stays here in the apical chamber. However, if you have a, a normal small molecule that can diffuse across cells, it should diffuse across to the basolateral um, side of this chamber where there's also media. If PGP transfected cells are here, they will keep the drug um, on the apical surf side of this chamber. And um, you can add a blocker and obviously encourage cells to go down. And so people will add a drug or an experimental compound of interest. And they'll measure at the end of that incubation time how much is up here in the apical side and how much got to the basal side. And that ratio will give them insight into whether PGP transport susceptibility is playing a role. You can do that experiment in a 96 well plate. Um, and so it's relatively scalable. And that's the kind of experiment would an assay biology group like mine will do in partnership with the medicinal chemistry group as part of a development program. And so when you're doing high throughput screening and discovery, you've got a target. You do a high throughput screen. And when the medicinal chemists are making those modifications, um, we're coordinating with them on, on modifications to those drugs and understanding things like P glycoprotein transport susceptibility. So I've got a few conclusions here for you based on what I've told you about. 
they may be a little bit obvious and, and they really are reinforced by Dr. Gottesman's talk that preceded this one in the, in the talk order. So we've used non-invasive imaging as a way here to really drive home just how important ABC drug transporters are for regulating drug action. And, and, and I think a knock-on of that is what a really profound pain they can be from a drug development and experimental therapeutics point of view as well. Um, the kind of mouse model and cell line models that people have generated can really help the drug development process. They can help understand physiology, but they can help medicinal chemists get where they need to get in the drug development program collaboratively with people like uh, pharmacometricians, people who study pharmacokinetics to understand the biodistribution of drugs and understanding that target site. Um, and of course, ABCG2 is, is a really important drug transporter as well. And we're, we're, we're beginning to understand that it's just as important as peak lycoprotein in protecting and playing a physiologic role and making life difficult for drug development programs as well. So I do have an acknowledgement slide here based on my work when I was at the Laboratory of Cell Biology in the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Gottesman's lab, and I had a really fantastic and large, I suppose, set of students who worked with me um, in studying and understanding the role of the blood-brain barrier in drug development. My collaborators at the National Institutes of Mental Health, um, without whom this collaborative program could not have been successful, and also the Karolinska Institute in, in, in Sweden, who are part of a graduate partnership program with the National Institutes of Health. Really fantastic graduate program that we have as well. And my colleagues at, at, at NCATS, where I currently work, where we still continue to try and understand the important role of drug transporters in, in drug development and experimental therapeutics design. I really appreciate you listening. And if you have any questions uh, and you'd like to contact us, please get in touch with the program coordinator. who would be happy to pass on your questions to me to answer. Thank you very much.